It's just a really beautiful day. I love cool weather camping in Southern California in the off season, but don't try it on a weekend. Since I'm in a Cleveland National Forest campground, why am I not dispersed camping? Well, first of all, I thought I'd tell you this fun fact about the Cleveland National Forest and some other Southern California National Forests. You cannot just go dispersed camping, you have to get permits. And that is not a California rule. I don't want to hear how horrible California is. I know all the bad stuff, and I know the good stuff. If you don't like California, don't come here. And if you don't like it, leave. I mean, I can hardly afford to live here. If it weren't for my parents, I wouldn't be living here. I understand why people want to get out, and I understand why people don't want to come here. But this channel is not meant to bash anything. I love California, and I hate it. And I don't want to really talk about that. But anyway, Cleveland National Forest is one of the Thanks. forests where you have to get a dispersed camping permit. And there aren't that many field offices. There's three or four field offices. And they're kind of a trek from where I'm at. So it would be a pain in the butt. Plus, the dispersed camping areas are, I think, pretty much at high elevation. And they're not really suitable for winter camping. Up near Mount Laguna is dispersed camping up there. I mean, that's at a really high elevation. And... To even get up there, you have to go higher than Julian, and Julian, when it rains, it snows in the winter, and you got to have snow chains, and the actual campgrounds are closed, so I cannot go dispersed camping there, and even if I could, I probably wouldn't. I would just go to one of the national forests where you don't have to go get a permit. The other thing about Southern California, even day use, you need to get a adventure pass or use your national park pass or other pass. Even for day use, it's not free. And I don't know if that's because we have so many people to try to reduce crowding, to help pay for the extra firefighting services, to help pay for the trash removal. I don't know. That's just the way it is. Even a day use, even a picnic area, you need a permit. And your National Park Pass will work great. You can get individual adventure passes for $5 a day, or you can get seasonal passes. But don't just show up and park. You're going to get ticketed and fined, and you're not going to be happy. And that's the reason why I am here in a Cleveland National Forest campground instead of dispersed camping. It is low elevation. It's not going to get horribly cold. Might get to freezing tonight. I'm not sure. It wasn't really forecast to, but probably 30s. I have plenty of warm blankets, sleeping bags. I even brought some firewood. couple things I forgot to mention about this campground. Number one is don't expect cell service. That's very common in Southern California, even though we're super near town. This National Forest campground has no reception. The other thing is the cost. Um, it's $15 a night. I think the equestrian sites might be 30 or a double campsite, but $15 a night. If you do first come first serve, you don't have to pay reservation fee, but there is an $8 fee for reserving online. If you're going to come here in the summer, if you are going to come here on an off-season weekend, make a reservation or you're going to be disappointed. This place is very popular, even in the winter on the weekends, and it fills up in the off-season. During the week, there's plenty of availability. Actually, I think I said two things, but there's one more thing I forgot to mention. It is inland. In the summer, it is going to be hot AF. So if you're going to camp here in the summer, bring tons of water, things to keep you cool. If you're going to be car camping in the sun, you're going to probably regret it. If you have an RV, you can use a generator, not at night. There are no hookups. This is a fairly primitive campground. However, there is potable water and there are vault toilets. But it is really beautiful. Just be careful in the summer. It's also prime rattlesnake country. There is a trailhead, Agua Tibia Wilderness and a couple of other trailheads that, or trails that branch off from there, something like 20 miles of trails um, inside the campground at the end of it. People walk, people park um, out front and then they walk through the campground to get to the trailhead. It is fairly difficult, I think. Uh, I would have to use walking sticks and even then I tried it last year without walking sticks, not realizing it's very steep going up for quite a ways. In the summer, it's dangerous. And if you don't have great knees, be careful. I don't know if I'm going to go up there tomorrow or not. I'm not going to go up there today. I may wander, have a look, see how it is if it doesn't rain. We'll see. I think you can disperse camp um, on the trails. You absolutely have to get a backcountry wilderness permit. Or again, you'll be in serious trouble and there are absolutely no campfires allowed up on the trail. So I don't know how many people do that. If you're interested, 
go online, research it, and make sure you get a permit. Good morning from Dripping Springs. It rained last night, and it didn't get nearly as cold as the campground hosts thought it might. Yeah, it's a beautiful morning after the rain last night, which wasn't super heavy, but it did wake me up a little bit. And yeah, um, I had a great night sleeping, mostly. The bed's comfortable enough. I have to make a few tweaks. I will probably not film it actually this time since I'm going to tweak it anyway. I might as well just wait. I will say though that the three inch foam mattress with two inches of memory foam on top is plenty comfortable for a night's sleep. Bed's a little narrow. I'm going to learn to live with that. I just need to make some little bumpers because I'm kind of leaning up against you know, my storage. Fortunately, the rain had stopped before I got up this morning. I did have to get out, and fortunately when I had to go to the restroom, it wasn't um, raining either. I got up, made my coffee, and have been sitting in my chair with a fleece blanket wrapped around my legs, enjoying the birds. Got up, walked around a little bit. I'm going to get up and walk around a bit more, um, do some reading, do some knitting on that knitting loom, and just enjoy a very restful day. It's getting really cloudy. Let's see if it's going to rain again. I don't know. If it does, it does. California needs it. So this is the way I came in to the equestrian loop. It's really looking cloudy up there. The trails go up into those hills. Yeah, even though it's Cleveland National Forest, it's also deserty. Remember, California is semi-arid, especially Southern California. And even in the forest, there's some high desert. Look around. It's not a ton of trees. Lots of scrub. They say there's chaparral. Honestly, I'm not good at tree identification. So I'm up there around that curve. So this is site 14, which you can see has no shade. A nice stump. I saw a hiker taking a snack break there. In fact, a couple days ago, it was 85 degrees here, according to the camp host in the winter, even though it got super cold two days later. I thought I'd walk down to the lower loop. I saw the guy who occupied my site yesterday leave. This nice guy named Hector. It's funny because his wife wasn't with him. She felt committed to attend a Super Bowl party and he decided to go camping. That's a nice kind of marriage. So site eight is considered one of the better sites because it has excellent shade. It is near one of the toilets. Nothing behind you but trees. You got your fire pit. His is still smoking a little bit the picnic table and then off in that direction towards the end of the campground is where the hiking trails are so even though this is a fantastic site you're you're going to get a lot of day trippers and hikers crossing by you every day during the day but at night this is a great place going to walk down to the trailhead. I'm not going to go hiking, not with rain in the forecast and the fact that it's super steep trails. But I am going to walk down there and show you. Wow. I think this creek is usually dry. Um, at least I think it was dry when I was here before. There certainly weren't any warnings. You do have to register for day use. If you do go down this trail and choose to disperse camp in the backcountry. You have to have a permit, a backcountry permit, above and beyond the wilderness pass. Ew, I think that's horse turds from that big horse group that came yesterday. Arroyo toad country, an endangered toad that breeds in this area. Anyway, this way is to the trailhead. This is pretty cool. Like I said, there was absolutely no water here before. I don't even remember. I guess the trailhead's over there. I didn't actually see a sign. I'm definitely, I didn't register, and I'm definitely not going to get my feet wet. Well, I mean, I could step across those stones, but I'm not here to hike. 
I'm gonna walk around a bit more the other direction. I am in no way prepared for hiking. I do have poles and boots. I'm not wearing them. I'm not carrying them. I'm wearing jeans. I don't have my backpack. I don't have water. I don't have food. That's all in the car. Literally, I'm not here to hike. So this area is the entrance to the Ahwatubia Wilderness. And there are a bunch of trails. The Dripping Springs Trail, Palomar Magee Trail, Wild Horse Trail, and Kutka Trail. And the camp post suggested to me, I try Wild Horse Trail if I did want to go hiking, um, that it does level out in places. Dripping Springs is 6.8 miles in with a lot of elevation gain, cons considered strenuous. You're basically just hiking up hills to get some great views. Oh my God, I would die coming up and down. Wild Horse is a 10 mile out and back trail, but obviously I would never even go that far. Maybe I need to get in better shape so I can come out here and hike sometime. And here is the sign. This is what always creeps me out in California. Good morning from the back of my car, my SUV camper. This is my last morning at Dripping Springs Campground outside of Temecula. It's a very damp morning. It either had a very heavy dew or could have sprinkled last night. I actually got up, made my coffee, went to the restroom, and before I could drink my coffee, it was sprinkling, so I had to hastily pack everything up, which is why I'm sitting in my car. I'm not even getting my camp chair out. I did want to give you um, a quick word about my Blue Eddy and my solar setup. Right now my phone is charging. On this entire trip, I charged my phone a few times. I used the mini rice cooker. I haven't even combed my hair. I should probably put my hoodie on to hide it. Camping hair don't care. I say that all the time. I charged my phone a few times. I heated up soup in the rice cooker for 15 or 20 minutes. And what else did I use? I used my USB light. And I'm going to show that some other time. It's just a light bulb with a hook that you can hang anywhere. And it hardly uses any power. I didn't even bother getting my solar panel out because A, I wasn't using much power. B, there was a lot of cloud cover. There was some sun yesterday. I could have charged it up a bit. I do have a car charger. If I were out long-term camping, driving somewhere, I could charge it while I drive. But I'm just going to be going home today, so no big deal. And it used about one quarter of the power bank. A quarter, about 20% depleted. Um, maybe a tiny bit more. It doesn't show you, you know, the steps between the 20%. But that's not too bad for two days of very light use. But keep note that I turn this thing off. I make sure all the buttons are off and there's no green light showing. Because if you, even if you're not using it and you haven't turned off those lights at night, that's a power draw and it's going to deplete more. And I've heard a lot of people complain. That's one of the big complaints about the Blue Eddy is the internals that still use a lot of power. If I were running a fridge, you know, I would have to be having solar. It's going to be interesting if I do get a little fridge because I was used to having that rooftop solar in my Transit Connect. It could charge when I'm driving without having to plug it into my 12 volt. It plugged, <clears throat> it charged as long as there was some, um, some sun, even with some cloud cover. I got some charge usually during the day, unless it was rainy or super, super, super cloudy. So having to have a portable panel to put out and charge is going to be interesting. Interesting on no drive days is what I mean to say. Trying to charge on no drive days is going to be interesting if it's super cloudy or super windy. So, but I'm not a full timer. I'm a part timer. I think I'm going to be fine. All right. It's 930 and I'm hoping the worst of rush hour will be over because I'm about to head out. I wanted to leave earlier this morning and I was like, oh my God, no, because I have to drive A, drive through Temecula and then B, get on Highway 15, which is a nightmare during the commute. Um, people going either north or south, south to San Diego, north to, I don't know, Riverside or wherever to work. Plus, you know, the town of Temecula itself has grown into a very big city. It was tiny when I was growing up. So anyway, though, I am now, fingers crossed, won't hit too horrible traffic. I'm going to hit the road. I'm pulling out of my campsite, and then I'm going to turn the phone off and put it down. Obviously, I don't drive with my phone in my hand. <laughs> 